All right, good morning. Well, we, how are we doing today? Good, okay, I like that. We're coordinated with the good, the welcome. Okay, um, well guys, it is good to be with you. My name is Michael Stoops. I'm the senior pastor here at Hebrew Lutheran Church. And it's good to be with you, whether in person or if you're following us online, so glad to have you. Please check out your bulletin. A lot of things happening as we move into uh, the fall. And my goodness, did fall happen overnight uh, for us? I, I gotta go dig out my jacket. I don't even know where it is. Um, but we have a lot of things coming up. Uh, you can look in your uh, bulletin as far as the uh, uh, Hebrew Lutheran Foundation grant proposals. Uh, Prime Timers is tomorrow. Card makers on Wednesday. Um, but one other th one thing I do want you to be aware of is next week we're going to have a congregational forum after each worship, worship service um, and on the 15th. And that is so that we can um, give you all the budget. We believe in transparency and accountability. So we make sure the whole church has the budget a month before the annual meeting. And so we're going to be taking quite a bit of time going through the budget, explaining where we are financially, where we're going financially. And so just want to let you know that'll be, that will be next week after both services. Um, so then I want to turn it over to Mrs. Sydney Spaulding, our Director of Children's Ministry, uh, to speak for a moment on the, um, on the Fall Festival, which is in your insert. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hi. So uh, I just wanted to talk to you guys about the Fall Festival really quickly. Uh, it's happening on October 21st from 5 to 7 p.m., here at the church, uh, we wanted to update you a little because there are some things that are going to be different this year. For one, the chili cook-off will be part of the fall festival. So if you're wanting to make chili for that, uh, if you could email me or Robbie Gayhart about that, it would be great. Our emails are on the back of the bulletin. Uh, in addition, trunk or treat is that day uh, as well and part of the fall festival. That's gonna be running a little bit differently this year. Uh, because we're expanding, you guys have been awesome. We've been able to do so much with this event, and it continues to grow. Uh, and so we're going to actually be doing the trunk or treat portion in this parking lot over here, which we've not done before. Because of that, there are a limited number of spaces. So I want to make sure that everybody who wants to sign up and have a car uh, has a space to park in. So... This year, you need to register in advance if you're going to decorate a car. If you look in the bulletin, there is a QR code or a website address that you can go to to register your vehicle. It takes just a couple of minutes, and then we'll be able to contact you and let you know what parking space you're parked in, that you're confirmed, we know you're going to be coming, and all of that. Uh, in addition, we're going to be closing that lot off so that there's not traffic coming in and out during the trunk or treat event, which means if you sign your car up and you'll see this information uh, where you register as well, you'll need to be there before 445 because at 445, that's gonna get blocked off so we don't have traffic coming in and out. So if you have questions about that, you don't know maybe how to use the QR code or need help registering, have a question, feel free to grab me, ask me and let me know and I can help you with that. Um, but other than that, thank you guys again for participating and for considering, uh, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Well, thank you, Mrs. Sydney. Um, Fall Festival is a great event coming up. That's also the insert in your bulletin. Would you guys stand as you're able? I want to pray us into our time of worship. Um, Heavenly Father, you are good and gracious, and you come to meet with your people. And so, Father, we pray that your spirit would fill us, that we would engage and encounter you as the living God, your power and your presence, that we would know it in this place. And so, Father, for all the distractions, everything that is going on in our world, everything going on even within us, I thank you that you lift up our hearts, you lift up our eyes to see you, to see your son, to see your spirit as the one God. It's all for your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Before the day, before the light, before the world revolved around the sun, God and I stepped down into time and wrote a story for everyone He has filled our hearts with wonder so that we are 
is all a gift from God that we receive. Brought the life, we opened up our eyes to see the majesty and glory of the King. He has filled our hearts with wonder. Love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain from beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah! 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, your love makes me sing, your love is surprising, I can feel it rising, all the joy that's growing deep inside of me, every time I see you, all your goodness shines through, I can feel this God's song rising up in me. Hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing, hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing, your love is amazing, steady and unchanging, your love is a mountain from beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, your love makes me sing, yes you make me sing, Lord you make me sing, 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 how you make me sing, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Okay, if we have some kids in the room, I think Miss Sydney's in the back, and she's ready to take you guys to a children's church. Church, so she's back there in the back. And before you have a seat, say hi to someone around you. All right, you all can have a seat. 
All right, well, today we are wrapping up our series where we've been uh, three of the last four weeks on women in the Bible, women in ministry, and women in the pulpit. And so today we are going to round it out with part four, women in the pulpit. And uh, it's just going to be fun today. I made it through the last service, so we'll see how, how this goes here. Well, I have to start off, of course, with another manly disclaimer. Um, today we're particularly looking at women in ordained ministry, or women as pastors, women preaching from the, teaching from the pulpit, those kind of questions. So that's going to be our focus. Um, and I know that, you know, just across the church, we don't all see necessarily eye to eye on that question uh, of whether... Um, being an elder or a pastor is restricted to qualified men or if that is open to both men and women. So I, I want to give a couple of disclaimers just to get my cards out on the table at the beginning. Um, first off, I have been on both sides of this issue. I, I've, I've found myself persuaded by both sides of the issue over the years. And so part of what that does is it gives me a unique perspective because I see both sides of the argument and the, the evidence and the uh, the. The, the, how people try to sort through the issue, but that also means I see the holes in both sides. I see the weaknesses in both arguments. Um, and so I myself have, have, have kind of seen the inconsistencies with which both sides operate and interpret the scriptures. So I'm just saying right here, I've been on both sides of this. Second, I work with people, pastors, and churches on both sides of this issue. All right. Uh, and I, I get some grief for that. Right. I, I, I um, a couple of years ago, rounded out a master's of theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is a complementarian institution. No women pastors. And I got quite a bit of grief from a local pastor about that. Going, do, do you know that they don't let women be pastors? Yes, that's their conviction based on their biblical interpretation but I'm going to work with pastors and churches that maybe don't agree with me on this issue for the sake of the good news of Jesus. I mean, even at our Community Good Friday service, we have represented churches from both sides of the issue. And so where we can work together, even with those disagreements, I want to do so. I want to continue to work so. The third disclaimer, I've been on both sides, I work with people on both sides, is that there are faithful, Bible-believing, Orthodox Christians on both sides of this argument. Uh, too often, uh, we kind of give in to the division and outrage today when it comes to these kind of heated questions. This is an important question, don't get me wrong, but we end up starting to lob arguments at people, not even arguments, we just lob insults at each other. And we pretend we're on cable news, apparently. And so on one side, you have the side going, oh, you guys are just bigoted misogynists. And then the other side's like, well, you're on that slippery slope to liberalism. And we end up talking past one another and straw manning one another. And what I've known from my time on both sides of the issue, working in churches and institutions on both sides of this question, and I know that that's a privilege afforded me as a man, I, I recognize that, is that there are faithful, Bible-believing Christians on both sides of this issue that hold the gospel most dear, that hold that the kingdom of God has come in the person and work of Jesus Christ through his life, death, and resurrection. We can be made right with God through faith by grace. And that the Holy Spirit empowers us for the work in this world. So that's my disclaimer. So where have we been so far in this series? Now, if you're a guest, man, you picked a doozy of a Sunday to show up. But here's where we've been so far. In the previous weeks, we have looked at women in the Bible and in ministry. And so we went back very early on to Genesis, to the very beginning, Genesis 1 and 2, and we said, what is the picture of men and women that we see there? What's the picture of humanity? And what do we see there? We see God making humanity in his image and likeness, male and female, he created them. He then blesses them, and then he gives them the cultural mandate, the mandate to have dominion over this world, to subdue it, to create culture, to have families, to, um, to be fruitful and multiply, to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. And the picture that we have in Genesis 1 and 2 is of a complementary partnership. The man is not the woman. The woman is not the man. But they are both made in the image and likeness of God with unique perspectives and gifts and natural bents and wiring. 
And they are meant to work together for the purposes that God has given them. That's what we see in the beginning. And again, this offends modern sensibilities because some people will go, well, we should just move to a genderless society. And then other people will go, no, 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 men are superior to women in every way. Or other people will go, no, women are obviously superior to men in every way. And both sides have lost the biblical point, which is that we were designed as men and women, both in the church, in marriage, in the world, to work together as male and female, as complementary partners. Then we looked at the Old Testament as well as the New Testament and looked how many women we maybe have just skipped over as we've read the Bible. I'm assuming most of us, we've been around church for some amount of time. We've heard the Bible read. Maybe we ourselves have read through the Bible. But we could just give into that kind of idea. Well, it's just a book about dudes, by dudes, two dudes, a lot of dudes, not too many dudettes. Does anyone still use dudette? Or is that, I'm just showing my 80s and 90s. Is that what's happening? Possibly. Um, but what we started to do is, is realize, well, actually, there's women all over this book. We, we looked specifically at Deborah in Judges 4, a woman who had leadership and authority and recognition. People were coming to her for their judgments. She was a prophetess. She co-leads with Barak, a trained warrior, to raise up an army against God's enemies. It's a, quite a picture of, of leadership. We have other Old Testament prophets, uh, prophets like Huldah and Miriam, others as well. But then this is not exclusive to the Old Testament. We see this in the New Testament as well. And we spent a whole time, a long time, looking at just the ministry of Jesus, how Jesus saw women, how Jesus conversed with women, how Jesus, in fact, part of his um, ministry was blessed by women. In Luke 8, 1 through 3, it tells us that there were women traveling with him, and they were providing for Jesus and his disciples out of their means. We also know Jesus, unlike a lot of other rabbis in the first century, had women disciples. Yes, the 12 apostles, the, the 12 disciples he chose first, they were all men. But we also have indications, not only these women uh, ministering to him and supporting him and the apostles, but also uh, the story of Mary and Martha. This was a story we didn't even really get a chance to look at. Martha's busy around the house. Where's Mary? At the feet of Jesus. The feet of, to be at the feet of a rabbi is an ancient idiom for being a disciple, right? Just as Paul says, I was at the feet of my, my rabbi Gamaliel. So Mary is at the feet of Jesus. Jesus had female disciples. And then we just started to unpack other places where there are so many women in leadership roles and in roles of, of influence and authority in the church. And we looked at Phoebe, right, the, the letter carrier of the book of Romans. Uh, Yodia and Syndicate, right, from Philippians. They're called co-workers with Paul. Nymphia, who was a householder, right? She had, like, opened up her household. And it wasn't just like, you know, she kind of, like, made sure the doilies were out and made sure the fine china was out and then, you know, let people come in and use her house. In the ancient world, to have the status and means to be a household owner meant you were naturally in a position of leadership over the gathering. We have Prisca, Priscilla, we have Lydia, and then again, all the women, some of these and other women mentioned in Romans 16. And many of them commended for their ministry by the apostle Paul. And so we see from the very beginning, through the Old Testament, through to the New Testament, yes, it's in the midst of a patriarchal world. Absolutely. We can't do revisionist history on that. But what we do see is God using both men and women for his purposes. And especially in the early church, we see these women rising to prominence and being commended for their work for the gospel. Now, having seen all of this, and we didn't even go into as much depth as we could have over the last three weeks, but with all of this, many people... Not all, but some people will say, yes, but. Yes, I see all the scriptures about women in leadership and women um, uh, doing the work of ministry and the work of the gospel, but there's a couple passages that say no. And so I, I know that I, that's, kind of, and that's kind of what I've been gearing up for because I know some people were looking, they've been looking at me for three weeks going, yes, but. 
Well, we got to the butt today. We're going to look in particular at three, one constellation of passages and then two other biblical passages uh, that on their face appear to restrict women from ministry. And we're going to look at them and we're going to deal with them. Now, part of this is out of our conviction, both as a pastor and as a church, that the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, the 66 books of the canon of New Testament and Old Testament are the word of God. They are the final authority. They are the supreme court of all, right? And that we need to position ourselves humbly below the scriptures. We don't get to stand over the scriptures and get say, well, I like this part, but I don't like that part. I'm going to take that part out. I'm not going to pay attention to that part. No, all of the scriptures. It's all inspired. It's all God-breathed. But that doesn't mean that it's all clear. There's some passages that are very clear and some we have to have some humility as we interpret and as we understand and as we apply, not just then, but today. So what we can't do, because we believe the scriptures are inspired, is we can't ignore these passages, right? That's what a lot of churches like to do. They like to just not even, like, actually read these passages in the 21st century. No, just skip over them. The churches that follow the lectionary, do you think they read any of the passages we're going to read today? Nope. We can't ignore it, though. We cannot, just because it, 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 rub, it, can, it can appear to rub against our modern sensibilities, and we're like, well, I just need to take a scissor or two and just cut it out. Got a Thomas Jefferson, that Bible. We can't do that. We believe the Bible, all of it, is inspired by God. We also can't claim that it's just a contradiction, because what we're gonna appear, what's going to be very apparent very quickly is that there's going to be some tension. Because we've seen how Paul has operated in ministry with women, and then he's going to say something that makes us go, well, wait a second, what's going on? And for some scholars that, that, that don't believe the Bible's inspired, they're just like, yeah, Paul's a little loony. He's probably a misogynist. He's just contradicting himself. Well, that's not an option for us because we believe that the Bible is inspired. And I think if we lean in, we're going to begin to see that there is tension there, but maybe not the tension we think. So let's look at our first constellation of passages. Now this, uh, I'm going to offend everyone across the course of the sermon. So if you're not offended yet, just hold on, okay? So good to be with you today. All right, let's talk about headship. One of the arguments against women in ministry is the idea of headship. And to say that there is, though uh, men and women are made in the image and likeness of God, uh, that within marriage and within the church, the male is the head, right? We see this in 1 Corinthians 11, Ephesians 5. And there's this, this argument then that headship must be maintained. And again, there's a sliding spectrum of that. So for example, you have John Stott, who was an Anglican theologian, and he would allow for women to be ordained and be in ministry, but the senior leader needed to be a man to maintain headship. That was the argument. Now, as I read these passages, right? As I read these passages, we can't ignore it. And so I actually do hold to a form of headship. Now, before you, before, just hold on, hold on. How we often think about that, and even how it's taught in some churches, I think isn't biblical. For so often, it's, headship has been considered about authority. Who has the final say in the house? Who's the tiebreaker? That's what's important. Who, who, you know, where does the buck stop? That's what headship is about. But it's not. When you read the Bible, headship is not about authority. It's not about coercion. It's not about getting your way. It's not about being a tiebreaker. Headship is about the responsibility to love, to sacrifice, and to serve. Here, I, I wrote this several years ago, so I, I'm just kind of saying I'm trying to be consistent. Husbands, this is what I believe headship is. Husbands have a special responsibility to self-sacrificially love their family so that their wife and their children flourish. That's what I see in Ephesians 5 when it says, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
is that there is a special responsibility on husbands in the marriage covenant to self-sacrificially give and love and serve so that their wife, their children may flourish. Now, does that mean that the woman has no responsibility or she doesn't have any say or anything? No, they're partners. But just as with James, for instance, when James says, um, those of you who are, like, not all should aspire to be teachers because you're going to get a second, you're, you're going to have a stricter judgment, right? Are we all going to be in judgment before the Lord at the last day? Yes. Teachers, we're going first. And we may have to go in for seconds as well. Everyone's responsible for their doctrine and their life. Teachers, all the more so. In the same way, in the marriage covenant and relationships, husbands have this special responsibility. Not to hoard power, not to get the final say, not to be served by everyone in their family, but rather the beautiful responsibility and gift to give themselves away. That's what headship is. And as we see it in Ephesians 5 and elsewhere in the scriptures. So I don't see this as a convincing argument, though, against women in ministry, because I, I see this being most clearly laid out in the relationship within a marriage, right? Not saying all men are the head of all women, or that all men have this responsibility for all women, but that within the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman, there is that responsibility. So let's move on to the next passage. Now we're going to get into the uh, little bit scriptures. So grab your Bible. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 14. And if you don't have a Bible, just grab the Pew Bible from the rack in front of you. We're going to be on page 961. Okay, just to give you a um, little bit of context, because again, we don't want to just pull verses out, because anytime we start pulling verses out, we can kind of start making them say anything we want. So we always want to look at the context of a biblical passage and text. Now, 1 Corinthians is really the, the first century equivalent of Christians gone wild. It is a mess there. Everything is, there's divisions in the church. Um, people are like, I'm free in Jesus. I can do whatever I want. It is just a mess. And so Paul is giving instruction, and particularly in chapters 12, 13, and 14, instruction about public worship. Actually, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Giving instruction about public worship. And one of his big points again and again is that we need to have order. That with all of the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are being poured out in this church, the gifts of tongues and the gifts of prophecy and the gift of interpretation of prophecy, they need to be done in an orderly way for the good of the church, the upbuilding of the church, as well as for their witness against the, or the witness to the outside world. That if someone comes, they're not just like, man, this place is just loony. I'm not drinking that Kool-Aid, but, but rather they would go, okay, I, I'm not tracking with this, and this is a little weird, but I can, I, can, I can at least begin to understand it. And in the midst of speaking about the order in worship, Paul is going to say something about women. All right, verse 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. That's kind of his big idea. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. All right. People will say, this is a universal prohibition of women in ministry. But very quickly, we realize there's a tension. Because before we get here in 1 Corinthians 14, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 11, Paul makes a huge point of women praying and prophesying in the gathering of the saints. In fact, that's one of the reasons that he's so concerned about them wearing head coverings as a symbol of propriety, a symbol of, 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 um, of propriety within the ancient world, especially that a woman, uh, a married woman would be uh, veiled. And he's so concerned about that so that they might publicly um, partake and participate in worship. So just a couple of chapters before, he's telling women to speak. He's just saying, hey, here's how we need to do it. Pray and prophesy this way. So already we can begin to see that 
Paul here is not calling all women everywhere, always in the church, to be silent. That perhaps this is not a universal command, but is more particular and contextual in its focus. Maybe it's more particular and contextual in its focus. So if this isn't, and actually most churches, even churches that don't allow women to be pastors or to be ordained, um, they don't actually necessarily follow this as a universal command because many of their churches, women sing. Not being silent. I mean, I know it'd be pretty rough if only us dudes could sing. Like some of you could carry the tune and some of us would just be mouthing the words, right? Likewise, even very conservative denominations, women are reading scripture, giving announcements, um, uh, speaking, leading worship, all those kind of things. And so even those that would take this as a prohibition are not necessarily being quite as consistent. Um, so what's probably happening here, right? If this is a specific contextual command, what is going on behind it? Well, something that I learned in some study recently uh, came from uh, the philosopher Plutarch. Plutarch uh, lived from about 49 AD to about 119 AD. He was a Greek philosopher, essayist, rhetorician, um, wrote a whole, whole bunch. And in one of his essays, he writes about listening to lectures. And something that he talks a lot about in that are about people asking questions. And in fact, if you look at other ancient sources, that was a common thing. In a lecture hall or a lecture from a philosopher or a rabbi or something, it would be common for people to ask questions. But you could imagine that could get distracting, especially if there's a whole bunch of questions. That could derail things. And in fact, something that culturally was considered particularly rude was to ask unlearned questions, right? To ask unlearned questions. Well, who in the church in this time period would have been unlearned? Who would not have been trained in the scriptures? Women. And so what we, in, what we see here is that Paul is most likely addressing the fact that these women are calling out all of these questions and they, they don't even have a basis for what questions they're asking. They're just asking, like, what, is this a Bible? Like, what, I mean, they didn't have a physical Bible, but they're just like, what's going on here? Why are we doing this? What about this? What about that? And it's just distracting and derailing everything. It's causing chaos and confusion. And so in the short term, he's saying, hey, I need you to, like, just, just like, we, we need to keep things in good order. We need to keep things moving along. We need to be edifying all the saints. But he also begins to point, and our modern ears can miss this, begin to point to a longer-term solution, right? He, he says that instead of these kind of unlearned questions, if they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. Now, again, that to us goes like, ooh, you know. But guys, let's go back through Paul's eyes. Let's go back to the first century. And you have a society where women are not taught at all. Not taught at all. They're not encouraged to learn. And yet, what, Paul, what is Paul doing? Teach. Let them learn. Let them grow in their faith. Again, we see this impulse of women and men using their spiritual gifts for the sake of the church and the kingdom. And then also, when, at the very end, when he talks about that it's shameful uh, for a woman, or he says, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church, again, he can't just be saying that as a blanket statement because he's already talked about women speaking in church and encouraged it. But what he's also saying about, speaking about here, is that in that context and culture, women speaking in public was generally a no-no, generally frowned upon. And so especially the confusion that's coming from these women is, is not only just stirring up confusion and chaos in the church, but also if you've got guests, you've got people coming in, people from the outside, people who aren't Christians coming in, it, it could send a very, very mixed message. And Paul just wants to kind of clarify those things that they would worship in order. So ultimately, the issue here um, is not about ministry. I mean, I didn't see anything in here about ordained ministry, anything about preaching or teaching, but rather he is addressing a specific context and a specific moment where questions are disrupting the worship gathering. That's 1 Corinthians 14. 
Let's now look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. And this is the this is the big one. All right. Now again, let's uh, get our context right. And I'm going to back up a little bit before the the passage that uh, that is the the big hot button issue. Paul is writing to Timothy. He has commissioned Timothy to go to Ephesus. Uh, which was a major city, a city of a lot of influence, and this church is facing some false teaching. And so Timothy, or Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's encouraging him to deal with this false teaching, to raise up leaders in the church, to, um, to care for the widows in the later chapters of 1 Timothy. But Paul here, he, he loves Timothy, and he wants to see Timothy succeed in this call of ministry. And so he's going to begin he, here, and he's giving... Um, Encouragement for both men and women. So let's start in verse 8. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Let's just pause there. Hey guys, maybe we need to follow this command first. You know, I know, I know that your arms don't get above your shoulders. I get it. I get it. But lifting up, lifting up a hand, I'm just saying. Verse 9. Likewise, also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Let's pause there. Now, again, here, this is not a universal prohibition against an updo, right? I mean, some of you read, like, heard me read this, and you're like, glad I didn't put my pigtails in today, like, glad I didn't do the, the braids today. That's not what he's talking about here. In the ancient world, to have braided hair meant you had a servant who could do it. That meant you were a person of some means, a person of some wealth. You were showing off your status. And what he's saying here is we are all too often concerned about the outside and not with the inside, the character, which counts. So again, even conservative complementarians who would say, you know, what we're about to read is going to bar women from mystery would go, well, yes, but it's, it's cultural expression. It's a cultural expression here. But let's continue on. Verse 10. Oh, verse 11, sorry. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Okay, just, I, I keep, hate to keep, you know, breaking in, but this is the same point that he was making in 1 Corinthians 14, which again, is very different than the rest of the ancient world. And now our passage. Verse 12. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, as we read that, I'm assuming we feel the tension. We've seen how Paul has interacted with all of these women, like Lydia and Phoebe. And then we read this. And so again, our options here, our interpretive options, are going to be the same with 1 Corinthians 14. Is this a universal command? Or is this a contextual command for a specific time and place to deal with a particular issue in Ephesus? I'm obviously going to argue the latter. So, so let's just see how he starts, or just even how the language he uses. He says, I do not permit. Now, that should also stand out to us because he's not making a command here. He's saying, he's simply saying, I do not permit. And in fact, this verb is in the present tense, which can often have a progressive feel, not progressive like, you know, politically or theologically, but progressive as in ongoing. He's saying, I am not permitting a woman to teach or have authority, right? So right here, he's even kind of beginning to signal that, well, is this a universal command? But then to, um, to, to focus in even more, there's a large question about what the word authenteo means. And that's the word that's translated here in the ESV as to exercise authority. Now, the thing is, is reading the English translation, and this is a good English translation. It is an English translation that you can trust. Here, I think they missed a little bit of a nuance. 
because they kind of said it neutrally, right? Like to exercise authority, just to have authority, neutral, can be good, bad, just have authority. The problem is, is that the word you would normally use for that, exousia, which is the most common word for authority that we see throughout the New Testament, and any first semester Greek student can tell you, is not the word that Paul uses here. He instead uses the word authentio. And authentio is an incredibly rare word. Not just rare in the New Testament, this is the only place it happens, but also in all of ancient Greek literature. It happens maybe five times, maybe ten at most. There's some debate. And when it's used in all of those other contexts, it seems to have a very negative connotation. Even the King James kind of caught on to this when it said to usurp authority. In fact, there, uh, the certain words in this word group can even be used to be coercive or murderous or killing. Like All of that is tied up with this. This is not just a neutral term for having a position of authority. This is about domineering. This is about using your force to have your way. That is what he is zeroing in on. Why would he be doing that? Because this is Ephesus. What we also know from 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy as well is that there are false teachers. And the false teachers are honing in on the widows, on the women, because they don't have necessarily the learning or the training that the men had had. Part of the reason they need to learn and be educated in this, but is going after that, and then they're uh, uh, spreading that false teaching. We don't know exactly the contours of that false teaching, but we can think that maybe part of it was about a disordered relationship between men and women. Because what we also know about Ephesus is they had the temple to Artemis, who was a female uh, warrior goddess. And, and there were even myths about her or, or some other figure like her being born first, and then men coming from her. And so in that context, where there's false teaching, where there's this kind of attitude, uh, especially amongst the priestesses of uh, Artemis, that, well, obviously women are superior, that it is causing a disordered relationship within the church. And Paul's just going, look, like, right now, we just can't have that. There, there's too much going on, too many things happening. We're, we're dealing with too much. We're just going to stop this just for a moment. Saying, I'm not permitting for a woman to have this kind of, um, to, to uh, have this domineering authority. Now, in light of that culture, we might also ask, well, why does he bring up Adam and Eve here? Because again, one of, the, one of the comments is like, or one of the angles is saying, oh, well, you know, if he's bringing up Adam and Eve, obviously this is universal. I think it's more of an illustration, right? Eve was deceived. And so have these women been deceived. Are women necessarily easier to deceive than men? Have you met a man? Okay? Have you seen the stuff we buy because of advertisements? You know, like, look, women, men, we're not just more easily deceived. I, I think that's empirically false. So his point here is simply the illustration of someone who has been deceived by the evil one and the damage that that can cause. We, we don't have... and. Also, what I would say is those that would argue that this has to be universal also need to go back to 1 Corinthians 11 and the question of head covering because that exact same logic is used when he brings up Adam and Eve there. And I think to be, and this is one of my weird positions, I think that if you're going to restrict women from ministry, you also need to, to, to believe in head covering. I'm just like, I'm like that's, I, I think that that's the consistent position because you can't say one is just a cultural expression, but we're going to ignore that now and this other one is an all-time, forever command. Maybe they're both cultural in a way. Though, isn't there, of course, something transcultural about it? Absolutely. We shouldn't have unlearned people teach the Bible. We shouldn't have someone who's just like, well, I'm, my name's Jedediah, so I guess I'm going to teach the Bible today. We also don't need someone who is domineering in their leadership. My goodness, should we see that after the number of uh, mega church pastors who have fallen. 
right? We need shepherds who shepherd with humility. So we don't have necessarily a reference to a particular office or function. He doesn't mention that. He's mentioning some actions within this context. The other piece is the question of how, how would we apply this even if it were universal? And the truth is, is that even co conservative complementarians draw the line in different ways. And so in some churches, because of 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2, they go, women cannot vote in the congregational meeting. And then, and then other churches are like, well, yeah, they can vote, but they can't read scripture. Oh, wait, some others, they, well, they can read scripture and they can do this, but they can't do that. And, th and there's all these kind of weird things. And it's like, sometimes you even end up with churches where you're like, oh, well, we call the women directors and we call the men pastors. They do the same thing. But well, we don't have a worship pastor or we don't have a senior pastor, we don't have that, but we have directors. We all end up drawing these lines in different places. In fact, even a denomination that does not ordain women said this in 1985. It says, Paul did not forbid all teaching by women. And I'm just like, wait, wait a second. You're saying this is a universal command, but now there's all these kind of exceptions to it. Again, being on both sides, I see the weakness. The issue here was a particular time and a moment when Paul needed to intervene. Not a universal thing. That's the picture of what's happening in Ephesus and the picture that informs us moving forward. Now, I know I've, I went into overtime on last service as well, so we're, we're just gonna, we're gonna slide right into overtime. I'm letting you know. Let's bring it maybe back down to earth for a second. Because I know some people here are really interested in this question of women in ministry. Some of you had never thought about it. Some of you have grown up in traditions where there just was always a man up front, and so that's just how it is. There's traditions where there were men and women together leading. But even though we might come from different places and though we may have to disagree, agree to disagree about this issue in our church, um, there's a higher calling and a higher mission that we're all on. Okay, so um, this past week, I went with Wally Lewis and David Eichenberg um, to the LCMC, the Lutheran Congregations and Mission for Christ, our annual gathering. We were in St. Louis at the beginning of the week for about three days. And the theme was all hands on deck. Part of what we've realized is that as a network, we are in our third decade. And in our third decade, we're still growing, but we're maturing. And we're realizing how the first and second decade look may look different as we move into the third. But what we need is all hands on deck. What we need is men and women, Gentile and Jew, slave and free, being one in Christ for the purposes of the Great Commission, to go to the nations to know him and to make him known. And I believe that's not only true of our network, I believe that's true of our church. We are in such a beautiful season. Next week, I'm going to have been here three years. For some of you, it was three long years, but I've been here three years. And God has led us into a season. By, by, your, by his grace and your generosity, we are in a good season. And we're in an area where there is, there's growth happening. We're going to have 200 units of apartments just down the road. We've got houses, housing coming in to the south and to the north of us. More men and women who can know Jesus and love him and serve him and worship him alongside us. And yet I also know we're in a moment where there's a lot of loss and there's pain and there's grief. I've been to three funerals. I led two of them this, these last two weeks. It has not been an easy season for us. And man, has our prayer list grown. I don't know if you've been noticing that, but all the more we should pray. We need all hands on deck. We have to pray. We need all hands on deck to serve, to volunteer, to love, to build up our brothers and sisters, to pray over them, to speak words of life and encouragement, build them up. We need everyone. We need everyone and all of our giftings for a time such as this. And then we get to see what God's going to do. Would you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, 
I thank you that you are good and gracious to your people. Father, I pray that you would um, continue to show your mercy over us. Father, there's much division and question about the passages we read today. And so, Father, I pray that your spirit, that your church would hear what the spirit is saying, that we would respond out of conviction and out of faithfulness to your word. And so, Father, might you lead us as men and women, as complementary partners to move forward in the kingdom together. And Father, might we see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's all for your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Would you all please stand as you're able? Well, we gather around this table and share one body and one cup um, to remember our unity, to remember that though we come from different places and different perspectives, we come to worship Jesus together and we have been made family through this meal. And so we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's life, death, and resurrection until he comes. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. As always, you don't need to be a member of our church or our denomination um, to receive communion here. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, we would invite you to this table. Uh, in a moment, we're going to start by communing this side of the church and then this side. And uh, you'll receive bread or, if you wish, a gluten-free wafer. Just let your server know. And then you'll move to the wine tray, which has clear non-alcoholic grape juice in the center ring, as well as prepackaged cups with wine in the outer rings. And then you can dispose of your empty cups and return by the side aisle. Please come forward as we direct you.
There's just something, something about the name. It's like nothing, nothing I can't explain. There's just something, something about the name. Jesus, oh Jesus. There's just something. Something about the name, it's like nothing, nothing I can explain. There's just something, something about the name, Jesus, oh Jesus. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Jesus. There's just something, something about the name. It's like nothing, and nothing I can explain. There's just something, something about the name. Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus. My Jesus In the name of the Father In the name of the Son In the name of the Spirit Lord we come We gather together your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace, and hear the joyful sound of our offering, as your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God's
Blessing. I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's a blessing and a privilege to be able to um, preach on controversial topics and for us to do so uh, with grace. Um, again, something that the world is sorely lacking when it comes to disagreement and grenade thro uh, throwing and whatnot. Um, and so we want to come in as brothers and sisters and where we can agree to be all the more in agreement and where we must disagree that we would do it charitably. And uh, I, I know that this may not be the end of the conversation. I'm glad to move on from this series. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of women, but I'm ready to move on to the series. Um, but I am, I'm letting everyone know I'm going to Waffle House after this. Uh, my wife and daughter are out of town, so I'm going to Waffle House. So you want to corner me about anything I said, you're going to have to buy me a waffle first, okay? Would you guys open up your hands, lift up your faces, and receive the blessing of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.